السلام عليكم globus pharyngeus foreign body sensation in the throat or a vague sensation of something stuck in the throat is a very common ENT symptom seen on daily basis in ENT clinics as much as 5% of all new ENT referrals may present with globus sensation only and it's estimated that just less than 50% of the healthy normal population may have experienced global sensation at one point. The incidence of the condition peaks in the middle age. There is no solid evidence that it affects females more than males, and it's assumed that this just reflects the tendency for females to seek medical help earlier than their male counterparts. All these groups of patients, and probably more, may present with a global sensation as their initial symptom. They may have lingual tonsillar hypertrophy. They may have irritation or inflammation of the hypopharynx or a postnasal drip. They may have a retroverted epiglottis touching the posterior pharyngeal wall. They may have a prominent cervical osteophytes. Some may have thyroid nodules or after thyroidectomy and voice fatigue and tension in the muscles of the neck and the back of the neck iron deficiency and plumber vincent syndrome and more sinister conditions like early lingual or pharyngeal uh, upper aerodigestive tract tumors but more commonly they may have a degree of one form or the other of reflux or they may have esophageal or pharyngeal dysmotility particularly affecting the upper esophageal sphincter Empirically, a patient may be categorized as having a globus sensation if he has this intermittent sensation of a lump or a foreign body in the throat for at least 12 weeks. And this sensation should be there between meals and you should exclude the patient having dysphagia or odynophagia or a GI motility disorders like scleroderma. Several patient symptoms questionnaires have been used in the management of globus patients. One particularly useful scale is the Glasgow Edinburgh Throat Scale, which allows the patient to grade the severity of one of the 15 different types of uh, throat symptoms. And it shows an emerging pattern in the average patient who present with globus sensation only. Some symptoms are scored highly and others are scored quite low and both the high and the low symptoms are of help in identifying and the follow-up of globus patients. The average globus patient would score high for frequent attempts at clearing the throat by coughing or swallowing, a sense of catarrh in the throat, or a discomfort in the throat. On the other hand, they will score very low for difficulty in swallowing or a throat closing up or a swelling in the throat or a sense of pain in the throat. The precise etiology of the globus sensation remains unclear, and as discussed, it has been linked to almost a dozen different conditions. But at least 50% of the patient presenting with globus may have either symptoms or signs to suggest um, a link with a reflux condition in one of its different forms, either laryngopharyngeal reflux, gastroesophageal reflux, or non-acid reflux. The proposed mechanism is either direct irritation and inflammation by the retrograde flow of the gastric contents in the case of laryngopharyngeal reflux, or a reflex hypertonicity of the upper esophageal sphincter triggered by irritation in the distal esophagus. This is one example of studies that had shown that there is no difference in the pressure either in the pharynx or the upper esophageal sphincter or the pharyngeal transient time between globus patients and non-globus patients. And the only difference in this type of study between the two groups using things like video fluoroscopy and manometry simultaneously was that there is more laryngeal penetration in the globus patient, but no changes in the pressure inside the pharynx or the upper esophageal sphincter or in the pharyngeal transient time. So what else could be behind this sensation of a globus? The old and initial uh, term for the globus was globus hystericus linking it to psychological backgrounds. And there are plenty of reports that have investigated the link between the global sensation and the psychological background. And some were in favor and some were against. In favor were reports that showed that global uh, patients as a group are a bit more depressed than normal controls. They are also higher on neurotism and lower on the extroversion scale. 
it has also been shown that they have elevated levels of psychological distress. And it is uh, now known by randomized control trials that amitriptyline could actually help the groupus patients as a group. On the other hand, a large Finnish study had showed that there is no uh, differences between the general population and the uh, globus patients in any of the psychological uh, indices. There have been very few reports linking upper aerodigestive tract malignancy and a globus sensation, including one of my own in which we had showed that if you trace back the patients who ultimately had developed pharyngeal carcinomas, one to two percent of these patients had actually manifested with a globus sensation well before being diagnosed with a pharyngeal cancer. So it remained one of the primary reasons for investigation, investigating patients with globus to rule out the possible uh, malignancy either in the base of the tongue or the pharynx. Um, the high risk group would need to be uh, examined thoroughly and also had any required investigation to rule out this. Uh, small possibility. So what do you know about the natural history of the globus pharyngeus patient? Is it self-limiting? Does it recur? If patients are followed up for periods of 30 months or more, then 73% of them were found to be still symptomatic. If patients are followed up for longer periods, up to seven years, maybe about half of the patients would have their uh, symptoms at seven years, and the other half would have their symptoms cleared. We'll go through the different ways of assessing and investigating globus pharyngeus patients, starting with the flexible laryngopharyngoscopy as an outpatient procedure that is safe, effective, and rapid. And it can show if there is any structural cause for the globus sensation, any uh, masses, ulcers, any uh, irritation to the pharynx, uh, retroverted epiglottis, osteophytes, pooling of saliva, things like this. Adding a, a dyed food or colored food like a kiwi fruit to the flexible uh, laryngoscopy would add more information about the functional aspects of the pharyngeal phase of swallowing. It will show if there is any pharyngeal residue, residue in uh, vellicula or the powerful fossa, any laryngeal penetration, any uh, aspiration, and transient time in the pharynx and other uh, important aspects of the swallowing. A barium swallow in globus patients has a low to moderate specificity and sensitivity, resulting in a significant number of false positive cases, things that look suspicious on the barium swallow but turns out to be a normal or no ab significant abnormalities when further investigations were uh, done to exclude any tumors, for example. Um, no abnormalities could be detected on a barium swallow in patients below the age of 30 years, so it may not be very useful to order a barium swallow below this age. The known association between globus pharyngeus patients and uh, gastroesophageal reflux and other reflux conditions uh, amount to about 35% of the uh, barium swallows showing abnormalities in the lower esophagus. Rigid endoscopy in the form of either pharyngoscopy and or oesophagoscopy are basically required to investigate the possibility of carcinoma in the pharynx or the oesophagus and to take biopsies if this is required. They are particularly useful in excluding a tumor in the blind spots areas, areas in the pharynx and the upper oesophagus that would not be shown clearly during flexible endoscopic examination, mainly the postcricoid area, the upper oesophageal area, and the apex of the pyriform fossae. About 1 to 2 percent of patients with uh, hypopharyngeal carcinoma would present as a globus sensation well before other symptoms of pharyngeal carcinoma like dysphagia or voice changes uh, are uh, there. On the other hand, rigid endoscopy can cause a serious uh, complication, morbidity, or sometimes mortality in about 1 percent of the cases. Another technique that was used in the assessment of the globus pharyngeus patients is the intraluminal manometry that would quantify 
the timing and the pressure gradients in various segments of the pharynx and the esophagus. And it was used to explore if there is any significant differences between global patients and the normal populations, things like upper uh, oesophageal sphincter pressure and timing of relaxation and things of the sort. It did actually show uh, abnormalities in as much as two thirds of the globus patients. But these abnormalities, again, were very uh, nonspecific and it could not uh, demonstrate or confirm the association between globus sensation and an elevated upper oesophageal sphincter uh, pressure or relaxation time or pharyngeal transient time and things of the sort. So it did show lots of different uh, non-specific abnormalities. None of them was diagnostic. The use of flexible transnasal uh, oesophagoscopy in globus patients as an outpatient procedure was a game changer. Some uh, of the cases were aborted because of inability to pass the scope or the patients could not tolerate it well, but it did show significant abnormalities in the lower part of the esophagus in somewhere between a third or half of the cases of globus patients. Things like oesophagitis, hiatus hernia, Barrett's metaplasia, candida infection, strictures, or even tumors in about 4% of the cases. So it was quite useful. The other essential thing at the first consultation of globus patients is to identify any of the red flags. Things like weight loss, dysphagia, pain in the throat, voice changes, otalgia, symptoms related to one side of the neck rather than in the midline, or if the patients had risk factors for developing a tumor uh, like smoking, alcohol excess, if they are elderly or had previous head and neck tumor, regurgitation of undigested food, systemic uh, symptoms like fever, night sweating, and abnormalities in the examination, like any uh, suspic suspicion of lymphadenopathy or any ulcers or masses. The um, risk of having an occult malignancy in global patient is quite low. There are few reports that actually show that the incidence is less than 2%. Now, the empirical management plan. In the very first consultation with the global pharyngeus patients, you will get to fill up the Glasgow Edinburgh scale to mark up their baseline. And they will also be checked against all the red signs. All patients may have a flexible laryngopharyngoscopy because it is safe and effective, and it will show up almost all of the abnormalities in the oral cavity, oropharynx, or the hypopharynx plus, of course, a neck examination. And then uh, almost all patients may be referred for a flexible transnasal oesophagoscopy, which would demonstrate if they have any lower oesophageal abnormalities. You would expect that at least a third of the global patients have a lower oesophageal uh, abnormalities. Up to half of them would have things like uh, oesophagitis and ulcers and strictures or a Barrett, so on. And then consideration would be given to whether the patient requires a rigid endoscopy, which is uh, risky and invasive, and it should be saved only for the high-risk patients above a certain age, or if they are smokers or have history of weight loss or other uh, red flags. And then empirically, you would consider whether the patient may benefit from a course of proton pump inhibitors for three months, or in a statin mouthwash, a low dose of amitriptyline, or voice therapy for selective cases. And then the question of follow-up. And some of the intermediate groups may need to be seen in three to six months. The mild and straightforward cases may be discharged after reassurance, and the high-risk patients would require rigid endoscopy. About two-thirds of the global patients as a group may have either symptoms or signs of one or the other forms of reflux conditions. And that's the basis of the empirical use of proton pump inhibitors for maybe three months or so. If the patient had the symptoms of reflux and these symptoms are of short duration, then he is much more likely to benefit from proton pump inhibitors. If the patient has laryngopharyngeal reflux symptoms, then the treatment should extend to more than three months, up to nine months sometimes on twice uh, daily doses of proton pump inhibitors and also combined with liquid alginate. If the patient don't have any reflux symptoms, then it's unlikely that the proton pump inhibitors would be of much benefit and a trial had showed that the 
benefit of the proton pump inhibitors were very similar to a placebo. The other medication which have confirmed effectiveness in the management of globus patients uh, by a randomized controlled trial is amitriptyline, which is a tricyclic antidepressant. A randomized controlled trial compared the effect of amitriptyline with proton pump inhibitors in improving the patient's symptoms, uh, judging by the Glasgow Edinburgh throat scale before the treatment and after the treatment, after four weeks of treatment, and did confirm that even a low dose of amitriptyline, which is well tolerated at 10 milligrams, at bedtime can significantly improve the patient's symptoms and quality of life. Another randomized controlled trial had demonstrated that adding liquid alginate suspension to proton pump inhibitors would improve its effect uh, significantly. Uh, the liquid alginate should be given in suspension form, 10 milliliters, four times a day before meals and at bedtime. Another uh, form of treatment to be considered is voice therapy to reduce laryngopharyngeal tension uh, with neck and shoulder exercises and relaxation techniques. A randomized control trial had shown that for patients who had received the voice exercises and voice therapy had significant improvement, improvement of their globus uh, sensation uh, compared to the control group. We come to the end of this presentation on globus pharyngeus for ENT trainees and students. A presentation with uh, some MCQ questions on this lecture would follow. Assalamu alaikum.